Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, coming to you from the Rockford Ice Hawk Studio here in Chicago, Illinois, this is Bill Swirsky's Sports Talk Chicago, one of the couple two or three best podcasts around. So grab yourself an ice cold one and a bowl of sausage, sit down, park your keister, and listen to this is Bill Swirsky, Sports Talk Chicago. I'm starting nine dickers. I'm starting nine dickers. All right. Sounds like we need to make a side bet. Starts with a C, ends with an O, and in the middle is a K. I think his hair follicles was pure malaria. All right, gentlemen, the answer was the bear. Coach Dickers' hair could single-handedly cure our dependence on foreign oil. 31 to negative 7. The bear. He's a merciful dick. The bear. This is a family show, my friend. No cursing. Yeah, that kind of language it belongs in the gutter, the speakeasy, and Coach Ditka's press conference. You know. Hey everybody and welcome to another edition of Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. This is your host Sean and we've got a big episode for you today. As I promised you last week, we're going to be hitting all the five Chicago teams, not just focusing on the Bulls and the Blackhawks like we did last week. Uh, Also this week, I'm going to be flying solo. We had, with the holiday weekend, we had a lot of people that couldn't make it on the show, which is fine, family first. So... Let's just jump right in. The big news with Chicago sports is definitely the Cubs trade. Cubs pulled off a an early trade because the, the trade deadline is not until the end of the month. But I think most people thought that the Cubs would really push the trades, uh, the trade talks and really um, use the deadline to kind of get more from teams to trade the some of the pitchings that they – that they have on the roster, so namely Jeff Samarja and Jason Hamm. So what we saw, though, is that the Cubs decided to trade early and not really push the trade deadline, and they made a deal with the Oakland Athletics where they traded both pitchers, and they, they came up with a package for for three well, three players and a player to be named later. So who they got was Addison Russell, uh, the shortstop prospect from the Oakland A's. They got Billy McKinney, who's an outfield prospect, and then right-handed pitcher Dan Straley, who's been up and down within the majors the last few years, and a player to be named later. So they've got it up getting four for the price of two. And let's just let's break this down a little bit, because I know when I first saw the trade, I was a little bit dumbfounded because all along, it, the talks and the rumors have been that the Cubs are going to trade these two pitchers who are... 29 and 31 and Hamill's going to be looking for a new contract for next season and uh, they can't come up with a long-term ex- term extension for Jeff Samarja so what we're looking at is that we we're trading older pitchers we thought what would happen is that they were going to be trading these guys for younger pitching and that's the, all of the rumors I've been hearing and that's pretty much what I assumed was going to happen is that they were going to trade these two guys for pitching prospects that would be ready come the time that the Chris Bryants and Javi Baez's and uh, Alcantara's and Solaire's come up from the minors. So then you have this powerhouse team that's, you know, coming up all at the same time. But that's really not what happened is let's take a look at at the players they got. You got Addison Russell, who coming into the, the 2014 season, looking at the minor league rankings, is SB Nation had him as uh, their number five overall prospect. And to put this into perspective is that they had Javi Baez as as their number 10 prospect and Chris Bryant as their number 12 prospect. So significantly better than those two. And we we see what Chris Bryant is doing. He's he's tearing up the the minor leagues. ESPN's Keith Law had him as his number three prospect. Baseball America had him as the number 14 prospect. Baseball Haven had him as the number nine prospect. 
Uh, Prospect 361 had him as their number eight, and Fangraphs had him as their number eight. So pretty much he's he's around a top ten, f- top five prospect in in the minor leagues. Which, if you look, I mean, you know, the the there's some potential all stars that are that are in the same the same league as this guy as far as these minor league prospects. The A's minor league system is they keep bringing up guys year after year, but rankings-wise, they're one of the worst minor league systems there is. Uh, so basically, the Cubs absolutely rated their entire minor league system. Is I mean, they just dem- like demolished it. it. Is They got their only top 100 prospect, and Baseball Prospectus had uh, Billy McKinney as their uh, most likely to have a breakthrough 2014 season uh, player. So they... Basically, their top two guys they just up and took, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. So let's let's keep looking at the players. So Russell was the number eleven overall pick out of high school in the twenty twelve draft. McKinney was the number twenty four overall pick in the twenty thirteen draft. So now Cubs have, if you look at the farm system, is the Cubs have three of the top fourteen players. Uh, in the minors, they have six of the top 41 and eight of the top 100. They easily have the best farm system in baseball right now. Um, Addison Russell, he was the 2012 Arizona League All-Star, 2013 uh, Single A California Rookie of the Year. Um, in Double A, he batted 333 with 439 OBP, a 500 slugging percent, a 939 OPS. Um, and that was in 13 games because he had some hamstring issues, much like Jorge Soler for the Cubs. But now that he's healthy, you, you sort of expect him to come up and really start showing what he can do. And he's a guy that theoretically could probably come up by the end of the year, but more likely next year. He's only 20 years old, so they've got, they've got a guy that they felt like they can't pass up. And Billy McKinney, he's a 19-year-old kid a lefty outfielder. Uh, he played across two different levels with a 326 combined batting average. Um, and, you know, some some good, uh, you know, he had a few triples, few a bunch of doubles, decent power with home runs. That's a long-term project. You don't see expect to see him for, for three or so years coming up. But he's, he's somebody that can project very well, um, especially considering that, there's a need for outfielders if if the Cubs don't convert them to outfielders like Bryant and Alcantara. Um, and then there's Dan Straley. Dan Straley's on and off over the last three uh, three seasons. He's been on the major league roster for Oakland. He's only 25 years old, so you're getting a young, much younger pitcher than Samarja or Hamill. Um, he's got 41 career major league starts he's 13 and 11 with a 411 era not great but he he's a guy that was a first round draft pick uh, in the 2009 draft so he does have potential still he was the 2012 a's minor league pitcher of the year so again there's there's hope for this kid um you know somebody that if he does work out and pan out then he was basically cherry on top of this deal and you end up having a guy that you can have on your roster for years to come. Thinking about this this trade, at first I was a little bit weirded out by it, and then I was a little upset because I really expected them to get young pitching. They really need to bolster up their young pitching. But then I started thinking a little more about it is, what in this league is is really coveted? And if you say pitching, pitching is coveted, but Right now, we're in, we're in the midst of one of the worst statistical hitting seasons in baseball history. Baseball history. This is a terrible hitting year. Players are looking, or teams are looking for players that can add bats to the lineup. And the Cubs right now are sitting on a gold mine. They've got Addison uh, Russell. They've got Javi Baez. They've got Chris Bryant. They've got Alcantara. And then they've got like other guys, the younger guys that are coming up. So right now, I mean, we're looking at it is, is 
You know, just the infield alone is you have Aris Mendy, Alcantara at second, Javi Baez at short, Chris Bryant at third, and that's just in the AAA. Um, and then uh, you've got in the majors, you've got uh, first base Frank, or, uh, Frank Rizzo. I keep wanting to say Frank Rizzo like the, the old jerky boys. Frank, Frank Rizzo. But you have Anthony Rizzo at first, and you have um, Starlin Castro at short. So right now, we've got a clogged infield, assuming that the uh, the big names are already coming up, assuming that nobody else bothers to come up and, and make good, is we already have a full infield. So you're looking at, you can trade, oh, and you know, also at short, you have Addison Russell. So you have th- uh, three prospects at short, you've got... Starlin Castro, who's actually doing it in the majors and has a very team-friendly deal that can be moved. So you, you know, you think you could trade him and really bring in some some pitching prospects because that's a guy that can help somebody win right now. Very team-friendly deal, and you probably wait till the off season to do that if you're going to do it. And then you have Javi Baez playing short, and then you have Addison Russell playing short as well. So clearly one of those guys is going to have to move positions or be moved for pitching. You have Alcantara at second, Brian at third, and Rizzo at first. So you've really got an all-star lineup coming up in, in the next couple of years. And I know that it's really frustrating as a Cubs fan to keep saying, well, next year, next year, because that's been our motto forever. But it really is coming to fruition. Is I mean, just look at what some of these guys are doing. Is Brian is just tearing up the league. He's... I mean, it's it's ridiculous what he's doing. Alcantara was an all-star in the AAA, batting over 300. Um, Addison Russell is, you know, almost a can't-miss prospect. And Javi Baez is starting to move past his struggles and starting to hit the ball again. Um, you know, and then, and that's not even including the other bats that you have coming up in single-A, uh, Daytona with, with Albert Almora, or uh, single-A, Kane County with Kyle Schwarber, your first round pick, who's doing well, or double A in Jorge Soler. So you've got these bats that are coming up. So it's really exciting. Um, so more Cubs news is right before the trade, I guess we'll mention this for whatever it's worth, is uh, on the 4th of July, before this trade was made, Jason Hamill was pitching really well and ended up with the Cubs beating the Nationals 7-2. to at the, In that game had pitched six innings, only gave up two earned runs, only five hits, had seven strikeouts, gave up a home run, and he was at a 92 pitch count, and the Cubs went and pulled him out. And he was clearly frustrated after the game. So let's take a listen to the clip where this is Jason Hamill after the game talking about being pulled early. Basically just a couple mistakes uh, that were up. Um, gave a few extra base hits today, but uh, overall pitched well. You know, I got, a big, got out of a big jam there in the middle of the game. And- that was a big turning point for us. I uh, would have liked to stay out there in the seventh. I have no idea why I came out of the game. But, uh, you know, I, I honestly believe you learn how to pitch when you get to 100 pitches. If you're not allowed to reach that, I think that's hurting you more than helping you. So, um, I guess it is what it is for right now. But, uh, you know, it's for a guy that's established and continues to work hard and prepares himself to throw late in the games, deep in the games, 100 pitches shouldn't even come into question. But uh, over, overall, great, great win as a team. The guys put up a ton of runs. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for you to pitch. You can be more aggressive in the zone. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's nice. We're rolling right now. It's so good. But you got a big hit. Yeah. I've been hit three times this year, so it's nice to uh, – <laughs> not, not saying I'm going after Tanner there, but uh, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> so, obviously, it was nice to get a hit there. Yeah. I'm almost more proud of the three-game hit streak now more than the uh, two-game winning. A lot of news outlets blew this out of proportion, but, you know, I, I could see his frustration. He was pitching a good game, wanted to go through and pitch a little longer. And it, as a starting pitcher, you definitely want to pitch – in you know, at least seven innings, if not eight or more. Um, not only does it is it good for you and you're feeling good and you, you want to get that complete game, but also it's less taxing on your bullpen, which is always good for a very long 162-game season. Uh, but ultimately, I guess we, what we realized is you don't want to see him throw his arm out and when you have this trade on the horizons, which makes me believe that since they, they pitched him that day is – 
that this must have been a deal that sort of just popped up. Sort of the crossover back over is, you know, I don't think they would have started him and then traded him that day. They would have probably been like, we can't risk anything getting hurt. So this deal must have sort of popped up. And, and I'm going to guess that they had been talking with Oakland and it tossed out Addison Russell's name here and there and not been getting anywhere and finally came to the point where Oakland said, we are all in clean out our minor league roster and the Cubs just went pulled the trigger so I'm, I'm guessing this is this was a deal that really popped up quickly because the the Cubs had another couple weeks where they could have leveraged um, teams that were doing better I mean look at look at the AL East where it's traditionally dominated by the Yankees and the Red Sox right now you know it's being challenged with Baltimore and Toronto and both of those teams have really strong farm systems. They've got a lot of players that they could offer up to get the pitching help to push them over the edge to win that division, which is really something considering you, know, you have the Yankees, Red Sox, and Tampa Bay Rays. So that would be huge for these teams. But So I felt like they could, especially since those two teams are competing against each other and they both have strong minor league systems, as you felt like, I felt like if you would have waited a couple weeks, you really could have leveraged that and pitted the two teams worrying about each other and the you know saying well we're tell Baltimore hey we're talking to Toronto and you know this is what we can get from Toronto and then telling Toronto well, we're talking to Baltimore and we could get these players and that those players and really leverage them because one of those teams is going to you know in a game of chicken at the end trade deadline is going to offer more than what they were because they're not only do they want to win the division and get the pitching that they need to get over the top but they also don't want that other team to get these prospects, or not prospects, they're actual major league pitchers. They don't want them to get them because what you're going to end up with is you're going to have your rival, the team that's competing against you, suddenly having a bunch of new ammunition. And I felt like the Cubs really could have leveraged that. So that tells me that Jed and Theo were really, really high on Addison Russell because they took that deal in a heartbeat and they didn't even bother to wait till the trade deadline to see if they could push for more so that really tells me that this came out of the blue and this was something that they just couldn't pass up so it is what it is we'll see how this looks coming into next year and this is this is nothing new for the cubs this is the third year in a row where they've traded two of their five starting pitchers uh in 2012 they traded paul mahome and ryan dempster Last year, they traded uh, Garza and Scott Feldman, and this year, it's Samarja and Hamill. So what is the, the starting rotation going to look like now for the, the end of the first half of the season and all the second half of the season? Clearly, it's going to be uh, Edwin Jackson, Travis Wood, Jake Arrieta. Um, so... Those are three, but who are going to be the two that replace Jason Hamill and Jeff Samarja? Um, we've got uh, Beeler, who pitched one really good game so far. Um, we've got Kyle Hendrick, who was just named to a AAA All-Stars. He was a pitcher that came over in the Garza deal. He's somebody that could step up and, and play. Um, we've got Chris Russin, who pitched... Uh, you know, after the trade was done and got blown up by the Washington Nationals. Um, he's another option. And then, you, I mean, theoretically you could put in Dan Straley, the pitcher that you just got from Oakland. So those are some of the options. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to go. I mean, my feeling would probably be Beeler and Hendrick would be the guys, unless they're really high on Russin. So... Let's let's see. I mean, Russin's the guy for now, apparently, but we'll see what that is going forward. Um, but there's uh, what I'm worried about is the Cubs had been on a big hot streak, and we're we're working their way up to a 500 record. And for this team, would be a huge coup. That would be amazing if you could have the Cubs really, you know, playing well and getting up to that 500. That would be a boost, and that would really tell the story of where they're going with tr trading Hamill and and Samarja suddenly you don't have these horses that are at the top of your rotation to to compete with you know some of these other teams and starters but 
it, you know, this is going to this is going to tell the story of where they're going right now. And I have a feeling that suddenly they're going to go on a really big bender and, and and lose a bunch of games in a row and and that's sad and depressing because you know this is a team that's playing with a lot of heart right now not as much talent and it's, it's a shame to see them fall like that but you know we don't know that's why they play the games but with the first game after the trade was any indicator they got hammered by the Washington Nationals and Villanueva should not be pitching more than an inning. He's that's it, he drives me crazy with his dumb mustache. But we'll see. Um, hopefully we can get some stabilization. Hopefully Beeler can come in and pitch another great game. Hopefully Hendricks comes in and does what he's been doing in the minors and playing really well. And uh, let's see. Is there any other Cubs news and notes that I want to talk about? Um. I guess a couple other things is, uh, you know, what what this trade sort of made me go do is go back and relook at what the Cubs have in their their minors, and they've got a ton of hitting, and hitting is first and foremost. And people say the cupboards are pretty bare with pitching, but I'm, I'm looking at it; it's not as bad. I don't think as as you would, uh, you know, you would you would assume based on what what other ex, quote unquote experts are saying. You're looking at who are looking at like you have the Baezes and the Alcantaras and the Bryans and the Solares and the Almoras and such that you're so batter driven, but they've got a couple of good pitching arms. Which if you look at other players or other teams minor league rosters, is they a lot of teams don't have as much pitching as the Cubs do. It's just overshadowed by the incredible bats that they have. But C.J. Edwards is another good piece that the Cubs have coming up. Uh, Pierce Johnson, you have Kyle Hendricks. Those are three pitchers right there. So you've at least got some some reserves in there, and you figure if those three guys pan out, and Jake Arrieta is a guy that, even though he's 28, he's a guy that you could build on. I mean, he's just coming into the prime of his career, and Baltimore was really, really high on that guy, and he just had some struggles. But he's pitching really well for the Cubs right now, I mean, he's flirting with no hitters every time he goes to the plate. So if you get, you know, Arietta signed to a long-term deal, and you bring up Hendricks, uh, Beeler continues to look good. Uh, that's three right there. And then in the next, you sign a free agent and bring up either Edwards or Pierce Johnson reasonably soon because they're in Double A. Then suddenly you have a decent rotation. You bring up these minor league guys, and I'm sounding like I'm drinking the Kool Aid and. And I, uh, I'm, I flirt with the Kool-Aid drinking and being rather annoyed with my team, but this is something that could really start to pan out. And I'm starting to see the vision that Theo and Jed have. Now, if we can get the, the business side to start panning out, you know, the Cubs could really be a threat to other teams going forward. Um, AAA All-Stars were announced. Cubs had four of them. They had Arizmendi, Alcantara was the only batter. Uh, Bryant would have, but he was too new to AAA because he's tearing it up. And then you had Kyle Hendricks as the pitcher, uh, Tayushi Wada, um, and Blake Parker, their closer. And the, the last two guys are they're older guys, and you're not looking for them to flirt and come up with the major league prospects. But it's really good to see Arizmendi Alcantara because he's really been surprising because a lot of – even though he was in the top 100 prospects – going into the preseason, a lot of teams or a lot of uh, these scouting sites had doubts and, and thought that he was going to be a pick to fizzle for this year, and he's doing really well, and that's good to see. And then Kyle Hendricks, who came over in the Garza trade. So he's a piece that we could see going forward. Um, anything else? Um, I guess that's about it for Cubs. Let's just turn our attention, since we're on baseball, let's go to the White Sox. Not too much is going on. They're, they're struggling a bit. They're, you know, eight games out of first place, uh, almost in last place in the division. But at least they've got pieces to build on. Is You've got Abreu, who's probably the best hitter in baseball right now. He's number one in home runs with 27. Number one in RBIs with 69. Batting 280, 959. OPS, 
629 slugging. The guy's just clobbering the ball. And I really thought that after his hot start, that teams would start figuring out how to pitch to him. But he's adjusting to how they're adjusting, and he's doing fine. He's not even slowing down. And just think the guy had like 11 games where he was he was on the uh, disabled list. So you've put figure those 11 games back in, and suddenly this guy is just really tearing it up. So in addition to having possibly the best hitter in baseball right now, you quite possibly have the best pitcher in baseball in Chris Sale. Chris Sale is just tearing it up. He's got a 216 ERA, a .87 whip, and he's 8-1 and one right now. It's just like every time he goes to the mound, he's going to find a way to win, and he's going to give his team a chance to win. That's phenomenal, and you, you put that in there, and, you know, even though you've got a slew of injuries and you're in a quote-unquote rebuilding mode, is the White Sox are playing really well, and they're sort of riding on the backs of these two guys. So what are the White Sox going to do uh, going into the trade deadline is uh, clearly they're not going to be buyers. There's too many teams in their own division that they're competing against that where they're already at the bottom to, to sort of say we're going to be uh, buyers because you're giving up the future for the now and they're not good enough to be winners at the now. And as much as it's been a feel-good story for the team this year and how well they're playing, it's you have to be smart about it and you can't give up prospects that are going to help you in even though you're in a rebuilding mode and you're winning during the rebuilding mode you don't want to overextend yourself is you want to bring up these young guys because that's who's going to be your future when you really have a chance to win but the the rumors are is that Dian Vistiato uh, is rumored the Giants have interest and apparently Seattle has a big interest, and there, um, there's talks about them trading him for a pitcher, a right-handed pitcher, Brandon Maurer. And he's a guy who's got like a mid-90s fastball. He's got a 90, 90-ish mile an hour slider, and he's got a really good circle change. So he's a, he's a guy that could fit really well into this White Sox team, and you know, giving away Dian Vicieto for that, well worth it. Um, another the, another issue with the White Sox is their closer situation is, you know, Nate Jones was supposed to be the closer. He goes on the disabled list with a back injury. Then Matt Lindstrom steps up, and he goes on the disabled list with ankle surgery. Then you've got Ronald Belisario, who just is terrible. Like, the guy is awful. I, I think I could go out there and pitch equally as well. I've never pitched in my life. So it's... It's really frustrating to, to see that. Um, so who's next man up? Is you're already on option three, and he's a terrible option. You've got to do something. You've got Daniel Webb, and then you've got Javi Guerra, who are, the I guess, the next logical next choices for who the closer is going to be. So we'll see, because Belisario, I mean, clearly over the weekend, another blown save. Uh, I guess you sort of had to pitch him in the extra innings game because you didn't have anybody else, but... He's he's just infuriating, and if you know if he didn't blow so many saves, think about where they would be in this division race. And which kind of, uh, I was actually talking with Gary the other day, who's usually on the show, talking to White Sox. Um, I said, "Do you ever regret the the Addison Reed for Matt Davidson trade?" And is I you know I, I'm a Cubs fan so the White Sox are more of an outsider team to me that I keep up on but you know to me it was I guess in the short the short uh, moment you look at it as you're having problems with closers you traded a closer for a, a minor league prospect and he was like oh absolutely not he's like you know you I don't regret that trade at all and he's like because you know Addison Reed is not a good option either and you know, barring those injuries, you have a closer in Nate Jones or Matt Lindstrom, and they're going to be a better option than Addison Reed. And you've got your future third baseman with Matt Davidson. So he's like, I don't sort of, for me, as an outsider, I didn't think about it like that because I didn't know as much about, you know, Addison Reed. But he was just very, you know, adamant that this was a good trade going for the White Sox going for. let's switch off baseball and move on to to basketball we'll wrap it up with with my two favorites is the Blackhawks and the and the Bears so the Bulls 
is we're right now we're in Carmelo Gate or you know the the Carm decision whatever you want to call it is everybody's waiting around for what Carmelo Anthony is going to do and this time around even though LeBron is again a free agent is we're not sitting around waiting for Car uh, for LeBron James right now we're sitting around waiting for Carmelo Anthony and if you listen to the reports the three teams with the best odds to land him are the Lakers who offered a, a max uh, contract uh, the Knicks who offered the extended max contract that because he's that they can add an extra year an extra amount per year because you know he was coming from the the Knicks and then you have the Bulls who are offering a significant amount less than the Knicks or the Lakers but they present the best chance for Carmelo Anthony to win next year and apparently he is you know, still a bit enamored with that uh, the chance to be able to win because you're going to assumably have a healthy Derrick Rose or as healthy as he can be with coming off two knee injuries. You're coming off of an amazing season with Joakim Noah. Then you're going to bring over or you're going to get rid of Boozer. Then you'll have Taj Gibson and potentially Nikolai Miritich. So, I mean, you're looking at a team that was already very good with all those injuries and you're going to add Carmelo Anthony, he's going to presumably uh, fix a lot of the issues that you had on this team, which was scoring. So looking at the, the numbers a little bit is the cap space for the 2014-2015 season is projected to be $63.2 million. It hasn't been officially announced, but that's the assumption that everyone's making. Um, you make the assumption that Boozer is going to be amnestied and that the Bulls are going to waive Brewer... Mike James and Emmonson. So you're going to have, uh, you know, Rose under contract, no under contract, Taj under contract, Dunleavy, Butler, Snell, uh, Dougie McBuckets, uh, Anthony Randolph, Greg Smith, and then the prorated uh, portion of Rip Hamilton's contract. So right now you're looking at, you know, potentially being able to spend 17 16 17 million dollars on on a player and that would be Carmelo Anthony which I really if you think about it if he takes that money let's say 17 a year that's over a four year contract that's like 60 some million dollars and when the Knicks can offer him 120 million some dollars so you're looking at he's leaving 60 million dollars on the table that's a lot of money even from the the lakers offer that they're leaving 30 million dollars on the table and you know granted these guys are filthy rich it's it's really hard to say yeah i'm gonna leave extra 30 million dollars on the table especially when he's got a money hungry wife so i'm really not expecting carmelo anthony to come back or to come so what realistically can they do so first of all, they've got the best player in Europe, arguably. You have Nikolai Miritic, who a lot of players or teams were, a lot of uh, media outlets were throwing around this six, seven million dollars for him. But if you look, I mean, his his European contract, which he's he's said he's done playing with the, the Real Madrid team, his European team, is he was making around two point five, two point eight million dollars a year depending on how the current or the, the exchange rate went because he was paid in euros. So it's not a fixed US dollar amount. And then um, if he's got to buy himself out, and right now the buyout's around three and a half million dollars where the, the bulls can do you know just over six hundred thousand dollars of payments of it. And then the rest would have to count as salary cap. So you buy him out and you have to pay him around a million dollars a year as for a buyout fee. So you're looking at around 3.8 for Nikolai Miritich. Um, so then you have around $10 million or so to be able to spend on another player. We've got a few options here. Is you've got Lance Stevenson, who he's a really talented guy. He's like 23, 24 years old, and he could really fit well on this team because he was, you know, plays for a very similar Pacers team, did well and playing under a much better coach in Tom Thibodeau and maturing at with another season in the league. This could be a guy that you really, you know, really does some good for, for the Bulls. 
but he's already having problems trying to match or sign a contract with the Pacers. So he could command like ten million dollars a year. And do you wanna do you wanna commit that to to a guy like that? We'll see. Um, you've got Luol Deng, who's a fan favorite, and he could come back and really fit well into the system because he knows it and he plays well in it. And um, but you know he's looking probably six to eight million dollars a year, and is is he worth that? Um, another interesting idea that Gary floated along is if Miami blows up their team, if LeBron doesn't come back, is Chris Bosh is out there. He could be a guy that fits in there and plays center, power forward, that can score. Uh, or Paul Gasol. And the issue is Paul, Paul Gasol is, has been a fantastic player in this league for a long time, but he is not the Paul Gasol of five, six years ago. He's the Paul Gasol of 2014. And they're saying, oh, he might accept a one-year, $10 million deal. No, 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 no. You don't, you don't give him that much money. If you can get him for like seven, all right, that's, that's doable because he could really be helpful to this team because he doesn't need to play these long minutes, but he can come in and help them score. So there's a lot of options right now is, you know, you could also move a Dunleavy and you can move uh, Anthony Randolph and you can move these guys for, you know, basically salary dump with trading for second round picks to be able to, um, to, br uh, to bring in other players because Dunleavy is basically, his talent set is basically the same as Doug McDermott's. So he's expendable. Anthony Randolph is a guy who, you know, he just came over so they could get McDermott. So he's expendable. Snell, I mean, he's, he's expendable as well. You know, so you're, you could just bring in a series of veterans and then a couple of key pieces, you know, Miritich over either Deng, Gasol, Bosch, or Stevenson, and then fill in with, with roster players, and suddenly you've got a, you've got a decent shot here. Um, you know, so there's a lot of options still open for the Bulls, even if they don't land Carmelo Anthony or LeBron James. Um, and they could also even bring over a guy like Dwayne Wade. So there's a lot of options that are still open for the Bulls. We'll see how, how that projects out because... You know, free agency really just opened a couple of days ago. And, you know, the pieces are, the major pieces haven't fallen into place. And once those do, it's going to come like dominoes where everybody's going to start falling into place. But a lot of teams are signing their key components or low tier guys and waiting to see about where LeBron goes, where Carmelo Anthony goes, where Chris Bosch goes, what's Miami doing. Those are going to tell the story of what happens elsewhere. All right, Blackhawks. Not much news. We we talked to Chris Block from the thethirdmanin.com last week for a long time about what the Hawks are doing. And really, you've got a situation where Taves and Kane are going to sign new extensions. And I have a feeling that that deal is done. They're just waiting to dot the I's and cross the T's because they, in order to sign those extensions, the Blackhawks need to be underneath the salary cap. And right now they're not because they went out and signed Brad Richards, which we'll talk about in a second. And the Blackhawks are over the salary cap, so they can't officially sign Taves and Kane. But I have a feeling contracts are done. Everything is negotiated. They're just waiting to sign it and announce it once they hit under the salary cap. So a lot of us assumed that this was going to be announced you know, right away. But I think the Hawks are are facing a few moves that they want to get done first. And I'm looking at you, Patrick Sharp. I think you're gone. I think Oduya might be gone too, or Letty. But those are going to be moves that the Blackhawks are going to have to do to get under the cap and then get this deal signed and sealed and delivered. So let's talk Brad Richards. Brad Richards was on a really good New York Rangers team this year that went up against the a juggernaut that was the Los Angeles Kings and got demolished in the finals. But he was on a huge contract with the Rangers that I'm assuming he felt a lot of pressure with the New York media, the scrutiny that comes along with it, and the scrutiny that comes along with a huge contract. And I don't think that that was a situation that was good for him with all that pressure. He's coming to the Blackhawks where he's not going to be the big name. I mean, Crawford is a big name. Kane is a big name. Taves is a big name. You've got a lot of big names. Hosa, Brad Richards is going to be 
able to just play. And he's coming in on a one-year, $2 million salary, which is very, very team-friendly. Um, so he really has no pressure. And you're probably going to expect him to come in and play second-line center with Kane on one side and presumably Saad on the other. It, is that a good match? I mean, you you got rid of a guy in Michael Hanzus who was 100 years old because he wasn't able to skate with Patrick Kane and, and uh, Brandon Saad. So you bring in a, a guy who's 34 years old, and ex- he's only one year younger than Marion Hossa, and you expect him to be able to skate with Kane and Saad. Can he do it? I don't know. But one thing you can be certain of is the guy wins 50% of his face-offs, and he can play the point on the power play, and he's he's a good defender. He's a good two-way de- two-way player as a center. So he's, he's a legitimate center that could hold the fort down until you have – Maybe a guy like Tavo Teravainen, who could come in and, you know, get some seasoning under his belt and step in. It adds a legitimate center. I mean, really, last year, come the end of the season, you had two viable options in Taves and Kruger at center. Other, otherwise, you were just plugging in old guys or guys that didn't belong there. So this is, I think it's a decent signing. Um, even though you got rid of an old, slow guy and brought in an old, slow guy, at least you brought in an old, slow guy that that put a lot of goals in the net last year. If you, if you look at it at face value is you've got a guy in Hanzus who scored four, four goals last year versus a guy in Brad Richards that had 20. It's a big difference. And, you know, total of 16 points for for Hanzus and 51 points for, for Brad Richards. So clearly, clearly this was an upgrade and for similar dollar amounts. Is it going to pan out? That's something we have to find out, but it was definitely on paper a good signing. Another thing is I've been hearing a lot of fans talk about who's going to be the enforcer now that Brandon Bullock is gone. Why do they need one? I mean, basically Bullock came in, got stupid penalties. You've got a guy in Christopher Stieg that could come in and get stupid penalties for you if you need that. Um, you know, there's there's players that actually can play hockey that can fill that roster spot much better than Brandon Bullig. And, you know, they've got Mashinter from Rockford that could come up and be an enforcer. He's a tough guy. But why do you need that? I mean, look at some of the names that they've had when they've they so-called had to get tougher. Is You had Steve Monador, uh, uh, Rodislav Oles, and Sean O'Donnell. Those are guys... Do you remember them at all being on the team? No, they got most of them got bought out, you know, by the Blackhawks. They, they're just this is a team that plays fast-paced hockey. They play good hockey. They play, you know, they do play tough, but they don't they don't need to be the St. Louis Blues or the, the Phoenix Coyotes to win games. They don't need to mash you up and, and spit you out. They they play good physical hockey they don't really need an enforcer so i mean i'm not looking for them to replace brandon bullock they they did a good job by signing brad richards to be a second line center and address a position of need hopefully it's a good stop gap and they just need to keep bringing up these young guys and filling out their their roster and making smart trades and that's what they need to do because they're they're right on the cusp again i mean they were one goal away from probably winning this another Stanley Cup because I feel like they would have gone in there and clobbered the Rangers just like the the Kings went in there and clobbered them. So they're still on the cusp. I don't think there's any reason to make huge major changes or, you know, do to try to make this into a tough guy team when they're that's not who they are. So I, I mean the Blackhawks the Blackhawks have a good team and you know we'll see what how they, they proceed for the rest of of the off season, but they've been very aggressive so far, and I look for them to make some more moves and make a big splash in trading a veteran. We'll see. The last thing I want to talk about is my beloved Chicago Bears. It, not a ton of news, but there's a lot of things because we haven't really talked about them much over the past few weeks on the show. So let's start right in with on the Harry Spike in... Walter Payton's kid show on the uh, the game, the third sports channel in Chicago on the radio. Donovan McNabb came on, 
and they were asking him about Jay Cutler. And this is some of the disparaging remarks that he had to say. <laughs> I think Jay might be the luckiest dude in Chicago, to be honest with you, with the contract that he received for, for what we haven't seen thus far. Don't get me wrong. I think Jay's got a strong arm. I think the sky's the limit for him. But from what we've seen here in Chicago, when you didn't finish the NFC Championship, which it was due to injury, but even with that, you haven't been able to get past that hump you needed. One game to, to get to the playoffs, couldn't get it done. Caleb Haney comes into play. Josh McCown comes into play. And then contract comes up, and all of a sudden you get paid like a top three, top four quarterback. I mean, are you serious? From what we've seen, if he doesn't do it this year, it's going to end up being a mistake. It's a big, it's a, this is a big year for him. Yeah. This is a real big game. Josh McCown, your buddy's not here no more. Right, he's and getting so 10 mil. You, you have no excuse when you look across the board. You have the best wide receiver duo yep. in the NFL. Not yep. to mention a great running back and tight end. A great running back who they wouldn't pay just about a year and a half ago. Right. And then Almost a tight walked. end is excellent. And your no. offensive line finally looks good because you throw the ball. What? You don't drop back 12, 14 yards. What about being in the system of this second year with Mark Tressman? You think this is going to be... I, I, I think in Mark Tressman's offense, well, what we see from Josh McCown, if you diagnose the defense, know where you're going to go and get the ball out of your hands, the offensive line looked great. But if you're going to get back to the old Jay Cutler floating back in in the back at 12 to 14 yards, your offensive tackle is going to be liabilities, and then you're just going to get back to the old old game we've seen. I mean, coming from Donovan McNabb, it's, it's really sounding like sour grapes because, you know, he was a complete disappointment in, in Philadelphia. I lived in Philadelphia for most of his tenure that he was there. I think I came there during his second year maybe. And I was there all the way till the time that he was he was gone, and sure he was he brought you know helped bring them to the NFC Championships a bunch of games. But look what happened the one time he brought them to the big dance. I mean, we can bring out what Terrell Owens uh, had to say about it, and then we could just look at statistics to back it up. Is he was the ultimate guy who lucked out? Is you know he was a ball manager. He had a good team around him and Andy Reid was basically perfect for him is Donovan McNabb wouldn't have been successful in most programs in this league he should be thanking Andy Reid for everything that he has in this his career so to turn around and come back and blast somebody else for saying that they should be thankful is you know that's a pot calling a kettle black in its ultimate form so Donovan McNabb shut your mouth seriously everyone's tired of hearing from you just go off and, you know, live in a cubby hole. And with that is you've got Jay Cutler, who has been coming in during the offseason and working on his fundamentals, and he's working with the quarterback's coach, and he's really trying to perfect his craft. He's He wants to be a great quarterback and win in this league. And he's in a system now for a second year, which is always good to have the consistency because he's had so much – change in this in this league as far as offensive schemes that it's ridiculous and i'm not going to give him passes on things that he's done in the past is he throws a lot of dumb interceptions and he's not always the guy who's going to buy into the system but you know what he's finally starting to buy into a system before he was just a, a gunslinger out there and that but he would have been a fan favorite you know in the in the 80s and mid 90s but this is a different NFL game where turnovers are terrible. It's not about big play, turnover, big play, turnover. This is about being smart with the football and being, con you know, making plays, but also being semi-conservative. You don't want to turn the ball over. And now that he's starting to buy into the system and really trusting in what Mark Trustman has to do is I look to see a huge upgrade in what Jay Cutler does in this 2014 season. You also have Alshon Jeffrey, one year better. You have Brandon Marshall, who's you know one of, if not the best wide receiver in football, that not named Calvin Johnson. You still have Martellus Bennett and uh, Matt Forte. This offensive line, I feel, is going to get better with more consistency, and you're going to have your one link, uh, weak link on the offensive line in Jordan Mills, who's going to be pushed by... Evan Britton for a starting position, I think. So I really look for this offense to step forward. So what else is going on with the Bears? There's really no no big news going on. They're getting ready for training camp coming up, and hopefully we'll be pre 
you know, Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago will be present there to to take in some of the sites, post some pictures, and tell you what, kind of what's going on. So we're, we're hoping to be there for a few days. So really what we're looking at right now with the Chicago Bears is position battles. And that's the big story going in. And this and having good position battles is what what makes for a better team in the season because you really want you really want competition and push so there's no complacency and that you're always making sure that you have the best players possible in those positions. So right, going into the season, you're allowed to have 53 men on the active roster. And that typically breaks down to, you know, it, it varies for every team. You can do whatever you want. You could have 10 quarterbacks and 19 running backs and no offensive linemen. You can do whatever you want. It's the NFL. But typically how it works is you, to break down, you do two to three quarterbacks, three to four running backs, five to six wide receivers, a fullback, three tight ends, like nine offensive linemen, nine defensive linemen, um, seven linebackers, ten defensive backs, your kicker, your holder, your punter. Uh, and so the Bears actually had it a little bit different last year. Is they had a position solely for kick returner in the name of Devin Hester, which they don't have this year. They're going to actually use a position player who will play a position to be the kick returner. So quarterback, there's sure there's somewhat of a battle there. I mean, Cutler's clearly the starter. And... I my sense going in is they're going to take Cutler as first. They're going to have one veteran backup and one young backup. And since they already got rid of Draw Johnson, the looks like David Fails will probably be the the third string. And then either uh, Jordan Palmer or um, Jimmy Clausen will be the veteran backup. And everyone keeps talking about how good Jimmy Clausen's looking. But we'll see. I think Jordan Palmer has the edge because he's a really smart guy, and that bodes very well for the the Bears system. Their Trustman's system of offense is having a smart guy that has a good arm, and that's what he is. So I'm expecting not to be too much of a battle. I think it's going to be Palmer, Cutler, and David Fails. Running back Forte has clearly got the nod. Backups, I, I see them carrying three running backs and one fullback. So Forte, uh, Michael Ford, and Kadeem Carey, I think that's pretty set, set that it's going to be their roster, barring injuries, and Tony Fiametta at fullback. Um, wide receiver, it's going to be Brandon Marshall. It's going to be Alshon Jeffrey. I'm fairly certain it's going to be Marquise Wilson. I think Eric Weems is going to be a lock for this team because of the ability to play special teams, his low salary, and being able to be a returner if they need it. So you're looking at probably two more spots that they can carry that's going to be an open battle. So you're looking at two wide receiver spots, and some of the names that are, are there, you get Josh Bellamy, uh, Armani Edwards, Josh Morgan, Michael Spurlock, Chris X. Williams. Those are some of the guys that could really be bound for it and you know you have to think about playing other special team these aren't going to be the guys that go out there and are playing wide receiver per se unless you have a big wide receiver set or somebody gets injured or something like that these are going to be the guys that are playing special teams and returning kicks so who can who can return kicks best from that position i mean eric weems as can return kicks michael spurlock armani edwards chris x williams those are the guys so you know it's going to be it's going to be a dogfight for those last two spots and even possibly Eric Williams spot if if he's not playing well but i have a feeling that he's going to be a lock for fourth uh tight end Martellus Bennett is the only lock at tight end um you you're going to have a bunch of guys that are competing for the other two tight end spots i'm going to imagine Dante Rosario is going to be one of the two they seem to be infatuated with him but i'm not as sold on him even though my cowboy friend Matt tells me that he is much better than what we saw. Um, you've got uh, Jerron Mastrude, Zach Miller, and Matthew Mulligan vying for the, the other, and Dante Rosario for the other two spots. The rumors I'm hearing are that Matthew Mulligan is going to have a, a legit shot at it because of his ability to block. And they can actually do a... a formation like they did last year where they have an extra blocker stay in where they used Evan Britton as a tackle eligible slash tight end when really everybody knew he wasn't he has no risk to catch the ball and that he was just bringing an extra tackle in 
if you have a guy who's a tight end who can legitimately catch the ball and maybe run a little bit, it it makes the defense a little more honest because you could actually go out there and catch the ball. So Matthew Mulligan is a guy who the rumors are that he's that's going to be his place if he makes the team, is that extra blocker to stay in and block if need be or go out for a pass, which is kind of a traditional tight end role, but they need somebody that's a better blocker than passer rather than somebody that feigns blocking and then runs out for the pass. He's going to be a legitimate blocker. Offensive line, we're, if we think we're going to carry nine, we're looking at Jermon Bushrod is a lock, Matt Slauson lock, Roberto Garza lock, Kyle Long lock, Jordan Mills lock, Eben Britton lock, uh, Brian De La Puente probable lock, which leaves two more positions or two more spots left on that offensive line. Um, means you have Cody Booth, you have James Brown, who's been on the team for a while, uh, Charles Leno Jr., who could be vying for a spot, Joe Long, uh, Derek Dennis, um, James Dunbar, uh, Ryan Groy, A.J. Lindemann. Those are all uh, Taylor Boggs. Uh, those are all guys that are vying for that those last two spots. I think that's going to be wide open, and I don't think it's going to matter too much, but hopefully it's guys that can step up. And as I was telling you, Jordan Mills is not a lock for the starting. The four of the five offensive line positions are set. I mean, Bushrod's starting tackle, Slauson's starting guard, uh, Garza's starting center, and Kyle Long is a starting guard. But Jordan Mills is not going to be handed that right tackle position. I think Evan Britton's really going to push for it. And if... If nothing else, I think it's you're going to get better play out of the right tackle, and that was the weakest spot on the Bears' offensive line last year. And it was a it was decent play, but it wasn't great. And I think the competition will, and having another year under the belt will make for a better better right tackle play, no matter who gets the spot. Um, defensive line: Jared Allen's a lock, Willie Young lock, Lamar Houston lock, and. You know, tip last year the Bears kept five defensive ends, four defensive linemen. I have a feeling this year that they're going to look at Lamar Houston as a combination. So it'll be like four, 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 and Lamar Houston. I, I, I think the defensive tackles are a lock. You've got Nate Collins, Ego Ferguson, Jay Ratliff, Stephen Paya. Um, you know, I, I think, I think those are all locks. Um, Will Sutton's going to have to be in there somewhere. So, you know, those... I, I think the, the, those guys are going to be on the team. You've got Lamar Houston lock, Willie Young lock, Jared Allen lock. That's going to leave you one more position open. It, you've got a lot of contenders there in the defensive line. you got David Bass, Cornelius Washington, Austin Lane, um, you know... Those are, those are all guys that could be competing for that last spot. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. I think that's going to be a very good battle there because this team really struggled on the defensive end and defensive tackles last season terribly. Getting to the quarterback and stopping the run, there's going to be some fierce competitions because this team needs to get better, and they all know this. And so there's going to be the veterans are going to want to prove themselves, the, the ones that were here last year, and the new players are going to want to say, look, we are – we're going to be the ones that help make this a better defense. Linebackers, Lance Briggle lock, DJ Williams being healthy. If he's healthy, lock. John Bostic lock, Shea McClellan lock. And then there's the undrafted rookie Christian Jones, who appears to be a huge favorite with the, the coaching staff. They seem to absolutely love him. And as I said, I really loved him coming out of Florida State. He's he's a guy who could play any of the positions, and I think he him playing multiple positions really hurt him in the draft. I think he's going to be on this roster, and I think he's going to eventually push for a starting role. So Christian Jones, I'm saying lock. Christian Jones will be on this team. So you have two more linebackers that uh, you can, you know, that need to win a spot on this team. And there's a ton of names, and this is another position where. It's they can. They need to get better. So looking at it is, um, I didn't put Kasim Green as a lock. But he's he's in there. Jerry Franklin, D.D. Lattimore, another undrafted rookie. Um, Adrian Cole. 
Those are the names that are going to be vying for it. And if you had to ask me, I'm going to say Kasim Green and D.D. Lattimore might be those two. But that's going to be a position to watch during the, the training camp. And then there's defensive backs. Last year, they kept six cornerbacks and four safeties. So Tillman, lock. Uh, Tim Jennings, lock. Kyle Fuller, lock. Isaiah Fry, they love him, so he's a lock. Um, Kelvin Hayden's going to be a lock. So those are those are your five cornerbacks. So you're looking at one more cornerback that's that you know you have. So is it going to be Demontre Hurst, um, Sherrick McManus? I, I I'm a little less much of a battle. I'm guessing Sherrick McManus will win this because of the special teams play. But the safeties where it comes down to is they carried four safeties last year and and. So carrying over, they've got Chris Conti and Craig Stelts from last year. So then who they brought in a bunch of a bunch of new names. You've got MD Jennings, Danny McRae, Ryan Mundy, uh, the draft pick Brock Vereen out of Minnesota, and then the former Pro Bowler Adrian Wilson. So that's a lot of names to carry four guys. So who's gonna be the one that carried it? I mean, you've got Conti who's played meh serviceably the last couple years and awful last year partly because the defensive line didn't get any pressure and there was a lot of big runs um you know no excuses i'm just saying he he was bad but he was i think he's the defensive line being good kind of covered up his mediocrity and it got exposed last year because they didn't play so well so You've got Conti coming back from injury, and he's going to be a guy that's going to try to prove himself. MD Jennings, new team. Danny McRae trying to make the roster. Adrian Wilson showing that he can play again after his Achilles injury. Uh, Brock Vereen, the rookie. Craig Stelts, who's been a staple on this team the last several years that you know the coaching staff seems to love. So who's going to make this roster? That's going to be the huge battle because that's going to be where they need huge improvement. I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to say the four that they carry are going to be Brock Vereen because they seem to love him. Adrian Wilson, because I'm going to assume that he's healthy. And if nothing else is he can play his a backup position and play well, I think. Ryan Mundy will be on the roster and MD Jennings. So there's going to be some stiff competition. So that means you're getting rid of, there's going to be four brand new safeties that have never been on the Chicago Bears roster before. Conti gone, Craig Stelt's gone. You know, so that's that's what you're looking at right now. And then the the kicking positions, you know, Robbie Gold's the kicker and Pat O'Donnell's the punter. They drafted Pat O'Donnell and they got rid of Kevin Butler's kid, which, you know, PO'd Kevin Butler, but, you know, the kid's a good punter. So those two positions are a lock. And they might bring in, I'm sure they'll bring in kicking competition for both of them, but it's just really, you know, to have competition there. But they're... Those are the locks. Then you may not be interested in this at all, but I'm actually very interested in the long snapper battle because we have had the same long snapper since before I could legally drink alcohol, I think, and Patrick Manley. Patrick Manley has been on this team for so long. I don't remember who the, the long snapper before him was. Do you? So now that he's retired, who's going to replace him? How's that going to work out? I mean, they've got two guys right now that they have signed that are competing for that spot, and I'm holding that as a separate spot, the long snapper. So you got Brandon Hartston and, and Chad Rempel. So I'm actually going to have an eye on that in training camp because I want to see what they have and, and is it going to is it going to affect special teams play because they didn't play particularly well on special teams last year, and they're really going to have to revamp this, and part of that is going to be the long snapper. So... It's something to keep an eye on for next season because if you want to win the Super Bowl, you've got to win in all three phases, offense, defense, and special teams. Um, touched on it briefly is who's going to be the kick returner. Is Weems has experience. You've got Michael Spurlock, Armani Edwards, and Chris X. Williams all vying for a wide receiver spot slash kick returner. Then you've got Michael Ford who, kicked, who did some kick returns in preseason last year and did very well, very impressive. He's the running back. And so you look at that, and he's got a different body shape. He's not the, the long, tall, you know, barn burner. He's 
quicker at the immediate point of attack, can break more tackles because he's stockier, but he did a really great job. And I I have a feeling that that he's going to be the, the guy or he's going to be a a big part of a rotation of guys that that does the kick returns. Um, you know, part of the problem with Devin Hester was is the complicated schemes that they run now for kickoff returns is you you're you're not just going for wherever there's an open hole like you're a running back is you know running backs have a specific hole they have to hit on a running play and if something else opens up then you hit it but kick return is i guess very similar with that you but you're wanting to be in that hole because other holes are going to be fleeting very quickly and devin hester always wanted to be a creative guy and be the you know do it his way to beat the the coverage and that worked great for several years but the last couple haven't been as great and so i think we're going to see a decent a decent change now that you're going to have a guy in there who doesn't have a hall of fame credential as far as kick returner who's going to have to toe the line of the scheme that they're running then I have a feeling that we're going to have much more consistent kick returns this year. I guess that's really all about it for the Bears. We'll be wrapping up this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Um, next week we'll come back and I'm sure there'll just going to be more baseball news, probably more hockey news with, with the free agency opening. Probably not much on Bears. So, But we'll see what comes up in the next week. Until then, make sure you check out SwirskySports.com. That's S W E R S-K-I sports.com. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Swirsky Sports. Um, check out, we also put the audio of the podcast up on YouTube. So it's youtube.com slash Swirsky Sports if you're on the road and can't get your podcast. And we want to thank the Rockford Ice Hogs for sponsoring the show. And you can check them out at icehogs.com. And until next time, bear down. Thanks for listening. Cubs win! What a lucky break! We thank Ditka and God for all they have provided. Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31, the negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the bears go bearing down